Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second passenger only ferry webinar. My name is Kalen Thomas and I'm an assistant planner here at PSRC. Today we'll be providing updates and progress that has been made since the last webinar in April, which includes survey results and preliminary findings from the study. A couple reminders um, as we get started that you'll see up on the screen. Um, today's webinar will be in listen only. We'd appreciate if you did not use the raise your hand feature and instead, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to enter those into the chat. There will be opportunities for questions and answers at various points throughout the webinar, along with a general QA period at the end of the presentation. If we are not able to address your specific questions today, you're always welcome to uh, reach out to us via email after the webinar, and contact information will be highlighted later in the presentation. As always, slides and a recording of today's webinar um, will be made available on our website. Joining me today from the project team is Gil Cerise, PSRC's Transportation Program Manager, and Christine Kissinger, Project Manager at KPFF, that is leading the consultant team on the study. Without further ado, I'll hand things over to Gil. Thank you, Kayla. All right, uh, can you hear me now? Make sure that we can... Uh, Yep, can you hear great. Great, thanks. So uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Kaelin. Uh, this is again the second of uh, three webinars that we're anticipating for this study. And we thought we would just start off with a reminder about the scope of the study. This slide here shows uh, a general outline of the, of the different aspects of the scope. It really is a high level planning study, similar to a study that PSRC did in 2008. That was a study that was, uh, um, that was uh, charted by our our executive board and focused really on our Fort County region. Uh, in 2019, the legislature added a, a, a proviso into the budget asking PSRC to uh, do this study, which is uh, in many ways an update of that, of that initial planning study with aspects such as uh, assessing uh, demand for passenger only ferries and, and looking at capital operating costs and things like that uh, for the different routes. But, uh, but it is a larger scope. It, it includes all 12 counties of Puget Sound, the touch Puget Sound. It includes uh, uh, potential for a passenger only ferry on Lake Washington and Lake Union, where uh, interest has been expressed in recent uh, years. Uh, it also um, includes uh, assessment of some several environmental aspects that were included in the 2008 study. We are looking at uh, advanced electrification and what kind of things would be needed to do that, as well as um, looking at an, a comparative emissions analysis. And those aspects are going to be coming up in the next phase of the study. Uh, uh, but really, what we are looking at here is kind of a high level. Uh, planning uh, study. It is not an implementation study, not something that you can just turn over the keys and let an implementer uh, begin, it, it, but it does identify uh, information uh, that is needed by potential implementers on what, what, they, what kind of hurdles they need to pass through in order to, uh, uh, to uh, advance passenger only ferry if that is something that is within their plans. Uh, I just want to also introduce, uh, Kayla mentioned briefly, uh, we hired KPFF consulting engineers and a team uh, of, of uh, uh, subconsultants that are shown on the right-hand side of this slide. Uh, so just uh, that's this, their uh, very thorough uh, knowledge background in, in passenger only ferry in our region and, and nationally. So it's a really good team that we've had working with us on the technical aspects of the study and we'll be hearing from them shortly. Uh, next slide, please. So just a reminder, this is where we're, uh, uh, this is the schedule we shared at, the, at our past um, webinar. Uh, you can see what we've worked on uh, to date uh, in 2019 into 2019, beginning of 2020. We spent a lot of time in that phase one identifying stakeholders that will help us inform the study. Uh, everything from uh, those who are familiar with ferries and passenger only ferries in the Puget Sound region to uh, 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 potential terminal hosts, jurisdictions, and, and others that, that might be hosting a terminal. Uh, and then uh, we've also collected a variety of studies. What, what kind of studies have been going on since 2008? And, and uh, what we're about to report to you on today is the, the conclusion to, in phase two and uh, phase three, where we're highlighted right now. At this point, I'll turn it over to Kristen Kissinger from KPFF. Take it away. Oh, and actually, uh, before we do that, let's, let's pause and see if there's any questions on the scope of study. If there's any questions on the scope of the study or the timeline, please feel free to enter those into the chat. I'm seeing some things on my audio, so I will try to work on that. Let's see. So a question here, will the study also be looking at funding approaches to fund expanded passenger only ferry service? 
The uh, study does not include uh, the funding aspects. That would be something for an implementation phase. Uh, so in terms of like potential uh, funding sources, I believe is what the questioner is asking about uh, for, for funding passenger only ferries. And that is not something in the scope of the study. Great. Uh, we, and we have a question if a list can be provided of other studies you're looking at to incorporate into the study. Uh, yes, we can provide uh, a list. Uh, there are several of these, uh, um, I, I believe we, there are several studies, including things like fairly recent studies in uh, Lake Washington, uh, King County Metro has been providing, and we have a listing of those different studies that we've collected in the phase one uh, that we can make available. So we can add that up to the website after this webinar. Great. Can you provide more detail on when the study is due to the legislature, if it's halfway through 2021 or halfway through quarter one? A good, good point. Uh, it is due January 31st, 2021. So it's coming up pretty quick here. Great. And with regards to scope, uh, will the study be looking at regional governance? No, it will not. Just a question on if the slides will be made available after the meeting. Yes, they will. We can, we'll be posting them on the, on the website. And I believe they may actually already be available. Great. Uh, can you describe the size of these ferries you're proposing, if not uh, passage only? Um, they are passenger only ferries uh, is what we're proposing. Uh, and so uh, I think maybe, maybe when Kristen takes on the uh, evaluation, I think part of that was some um, assumptions added in about the, the, um, what, what the service would look like, the type of boats and things like that by, by route. So maybe she can touch on that. Great. Any other questions? No, it looks like we can move on here. So take it away, Kristen. Okay. So it looks like audio and video are working. So great. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Kristen Kissinger and I'm with KPFF Consulting Engineers, um, the PM for this study with a variety of really talented self-consultants that have been helping us as well. Um, what I'm going to go through today is really we're focusing on getting back to you on the survey um, findings and also where we're at in this study. Um, the slide that you're looking on right now has lots of information. Um, thank you to everyone who did take the time to take the survey. We had over 10,500 respondents, so thank you for that. Um, and if you didn't take the survey, I'm going to explain to you a little bit about what it entailed. So really the um, intent of the survey was to identify, keep it simple, but also identify um, which routes were people interested in by regional region and area and ge geography essentially. And then also what were the priorities of those different regions? Um, you know, it's 12 counties, it's up and down the entire, entire Puget Sound. We know that these communities are very different and have different priorities. So we really wanted to gauge what that was and incorporate that into our findings and analysis. So um, you can see the routes that were provided on the survey are in that graphic on the left and right. Um, the North Sound area is very long, so we had to cut it into two pieces. And then you can also see the respondents by county on the right. Um, Whatcom County, wow, lots of responses from Whatcom. Um, but I also just want to let everyone know that the way that we looked at the analysis and all the data was by county. So it's not like, um, you know, performance from one county over the other skewed any of the data. We really wanted to understand by county of origin, what were people interested in? Where did they want to go? What did they think had promise and what were the priorities? Um, so there was two different ways to identify the routes of interest. One was looking at a map. The map of those that you see there were really based on existing or previously studied routes. Um, those that were in the 2008 PSRC study, those that have been studied more recently. There was also an opportunity for folks to write in. Um, you can see a couple examples of some notable write-in routes. Um, and you can also guess that we had about every possible combination from Bellingham also represented on the survey. So um, it was really great and um, it was helpful for us and we used it in our analysis moving forward. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Kaylin. Okay. So what were the priorities? Um, we sorted those by county and then also by region and um, looked at what were the top criteria. And it was, it was great to see that travel time was across the board important to all regions. 
as well as quick implementation. Everyone wants things yesterday, right? Um, we did seem, see some notable differences um, in the peninsula and north regions. We saw recreation came to the high on the list. Um, and then also for the PSRC in Thurston County, ridership um, and ridership potential was one of the top criteria. So I'm gonna um, go to the next slide, explain to you our approach and then pause for questions. So um, what are we doing here? What, what kind of analysis are we looking at? How are we going about this? I mean, it's a huge geographic area. So we really needed to be able to use our limited project resources on the more detailed analysis on just a few. So the way that we did that is looked at analysis in three, three and four different levels. Um, and the approach and what PSRC really wanted um, was to make sure that each of these routes that was reviewed had something that was helpful for their local jurisdiction, regional jurisdiction to move forward with, understanding obstacles or hurdles or um, opportunities. So in our tier one, um, and I'll go into these in more detail um, in the following presentation, but we really looked at, you know, what are some of these more fatal flaws that contribute to time and money and environmental concerns? And that's confined waterways, that's land use compatibility. Is it even an allowed use? Um, in tier two, we really took, um, you know, what was said in the survey, looked at travel time savings um, and community interest. And then tier three, that's where we scored and ranked some of the routes and identified those for further analysis. And, a lot more criteria there, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, so we're going to pause here, um, take some questions, and then I, what's next in the presentation is I'm going to walk you through each of the criteria in each of the tiers. So Kaylin, I'll leave it to you to give me some questions. Yeah, one question here so far. Did, uh, did you study wake wash and do you have any insight why all the interest from Whatcom County? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So wake wash, that's really something that's more of a route by route basis, but the intent with the confined waterway was to kind of narrow out some of those that we know have issues. So um, a confined waterway, as an example, is Ridge Passage, um, which is already going under extreme monitoring um, and has, you know, the KT fast ferry implementation currently underway doing all of that analysis. Dana Passage and some of those others that um, have confined restricted waterways with single family residential on either side. So while we didn't look into wake wash itself, one of our criteria in um, looking at where that might be an issue is this confined waterway metric. Um, secondly, the interest question of Whatcom County, um, we think it might've been a radio station that plugged it actually, but we're not quite sure. Um, but we were happy to have it. It's really a great response when you send out a public survey about a, a planning study, not a construction project. You know, you don't often get this um, heavy of a response, especially in the middle of a pandemic. So we were very happy to hear from everyone. Is there any other questions about um, the tiered approach or any of the survey results? Yeah, there is just a comment here that uh, Whatcom radio station making a new story about it is how, how someone heard about it. Yeah. Um, someone asking, um, ridership was deemed an essential criteria in the PSRC region described in previous slides. Uh, I know Des Moines commissioned and has completed a demand study recently. Is that study incorporated here? Great question. Um, yes, so the city of Des Moines has been in contact with us and we, we have received their study. Um, unfortunately, their schedules didn't completely align for that information to be um, helpful for our initial analysis. Um, but we did look at it and make sure that there was alignment and concurrence. Um, and we are trying to set up a meeting with the city of Des Moines following this webinar. Can you speak to any of the plans for outreach when the draft study comes out? Yeah, so our phase four outreach, um, what we're working towards now is once we have these routes for further analysis, we really need to talk with those local agencies um, and jurisdictions to make sure that we understand, you know, terminal um, constraints and opportunities. 
Um, some of them we know very well, some of them we don't yet. So um, we'll need their local expertise because we can't even really get boots on the ground in many of these places um, due to the current climate. Um, but our phase four analysis or phase four outreach will be very similar in that we will be accepting um, comments on our POF um, email. We will also be updating our website. We will plan to have another webinar um, before the final draft is completed. Yeah, and maybe I can jump in. This is Gil uh, from PSRC. On that uh, topic, as Kristen, you said, we, the intent is to have a draft uh, of the study up on, on our website in time for that webinar in October. So just, just so you know. And then a question, uh, what type of ridership analysis is or will be done to su support the top tier routes? Great question, Paul. You're not going to throw me any softballs here. Um, so. This, it's a really good point because the ridership analysis is very difficult in these different regions. PSRC has a great um, modeling tool, but of course it's only for that region. Um, and so we've been looking at lots of different avenues to get information that's comparable um, and working with the PSRC data staff to see how we can use those that are both in the PSRC region, um, use a similar um, similar um, means and methods as we've used on previous feasibility studies, and then using the data that we can and do have for any recreational routes. Great, it looks like those are all the questions we have so far. Great. Okay, let's get into it then. So I do not expect you to be able to read this font. Um, I understand that it's quite small, but I just wanted everyone to understand um, kind of the vastness of what we looked at. Um, so, on the survey, there was a limited number of routes shown that were previously studied. But at the same time, concurrently, our consultant team had been working on, um, you know, what are potential destinations and where are those land uses compatible? So our list of review was quite extensive and 45 routes. Um, you know, those that made it to, you know, the tier two level of review, um, yeah, still on this one was down to 36 routes. And then in, uh, we took 18 routes to do this more extensive scoring analysis, leading to approximately eight routes, which Gil will share with you towards the end of the presentation after I walk through the different criteria and metrics. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so tier one analysis. Again, this is really focusing on like what is going to make implementation expensive and or, you know, very, um, challenging as far as environmental permitting or, um, you know, compatible land uses. So what we did is, again, we got this vast list of routes based on destination review, uh, where people would want to go, and then started looking at which one of those routes are located within confined waterways that may have some of these wake wash issues, and then also which were compatible to even accept a ferry terminal site. Um, you know, there's many single family residential properties along the water, those are not fit for um, a ferry terminal. They're not zoned properly to accept that type of use. So that was our first tier of review. Next slide. Tier two review um, focused on a couple elements. Really, we we're looking at time, travel time savings. Um, we heard that in the survey that it was very important to people. And you know, it's important to me, it's important to most people is that is it gonna get me there in a competitive amount of time as my other options that I have? Um, so what we used was uh, savings within plus or minus 10 minutes, knowing that um, past and early ferry travel does have, um, it's more enjoyable in, most, in many cases than a very crammed bus or other type of use. So we did give it a 10 minute, it didn't have to be a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, but we are having very different geographic regions. So we couldn't compare them to each other the same. So those travel time savings or comparable um, transit trip was looked at differently if it was an urban route versus if it was a non-urban route. Um, what do you compare it to? If it's an urban route, we looked at transit. And if it was a non-urban route, we looked at car trips. Um, it's not reasonable to compare, you know, something from the peninsula to a transit trip when it may be six or more legs. So we said, what, you know, what were people going to use? What's the comparable mode? And that was car in, in many of those non-urban instances. 
Um, the other thing that we did is when looking at that car travel, you know, our traffic out there is nothing like what it was. Who knows what it will be in the future? We had to do the best that we could within this time. So we used um, Google trip information and we also applied a traffic factor to the I-5 corridor of um, about 50% to make sure we were taking into account those really congested I-5 corridor um, when it's in more typical um, times. Okay, next slide. Another component of the tier two analysis is if it was, um, if it did save time, then were people interested in it? Um, that was important as well as, or maybe there's some additional considerations that it wasn't on people's radar, but we felt it, you know, in our due diligence to make sure that it was looked at. And that was places where it had over five, um, 50,000 potential commuters. But there was very significant development since 2015 when some of the other um, lake study routes were done to make sure that, you know, to account for a lot of the development that has occurred and interest and ridership that's happened, and also some resiliency opportunities. Um, again, going back to community interest, as I said before, we looked at county um, information by county. So which route were people most interested by county? And we sorted it that way. And it had to have at least 10% of that county's responses um, to show interest and to meet that interest criteria. Okay, next slide. So, you know, where are we at? Um, we got through tier one and tier two, which routes were going to be looked at for tier three analysis. And these are the routes up here on the slide. Um, we really needed a way to be able to um, categorize them and have their own unique profiles, knowing that commute routes are very different than a discretionary or recreational type of route. So um, you can see them here lined up. And um, we had some Puget Sound routes, we have lake routes, um, several recreational routes from Bellingham up to San Juan Islands, from the peninsula over, and also our airport route. Um, this one's kind of interesting and going back to the Des Moines study is um, in the 2008 PSRC study, they had a Bainbridge Island to Des Moines route listed in there. Um, so this was something that was on our survey that we provided as Southworth to Des Moines um, knowing that, you know, Kitsap Transit will be implementing their Southworth route out of Southworth, not that that terminal can accept more, um, more service now, but just that that made more sense coming from the Kitsap Peninsula than Bainbridge Island, which has to cross more ferry traffic, and there's not really a place for them to dock. So that was what we um, looked at in our Tier 3 analysis. And given that, I think this is a good place to stop and take some questions before we move on. Kaylin, I want you to read me some questions, please. Yeah, if you have any questions here, feel free to enter them into the chat. Uh, question if you can comment on how the Everett Seattle route is looking, might get into this later in the presentation. Oh, yep. We will get into that later in the presentation, but you can see that we have an Everett to Seattle route that lo we looked at in our tier three analysis, which I'll step through in more detail after this slide is those different components of tier three and how we analyzed these routes that are in front of you. So the tier three list shows eight routes to and from Seattle. Does the study contemplate additional terminal opportunities in Seattle? The study will be identifying capacity issues in Seattle. Um, we're not, the study doesn't look at implementation timeframes, but rather that there's an issue here that needs to be worked out, but that there are, is a lot of interest in coming to Seattle. And does the study take into account bus connections to ferry terminals? Yes, and I will be getting into that in our modal analysis in the next couple of slides. Um, can you speak to the demand from urban center to urban center, for example, Everett to Seattle and Tacoma to Seattle? Um, yes, I will do that in the next couple of slides. So maybe if these are more just tier three analysis, I can keep going if that makes sense. 
think that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it looks like a lot of these we'll cover, so we'll move okay. on. Okay, let's do that. Okay. So, um, again, you know, with limited time and resources to do this study, we really had to make sure that we had a way to narrow it down to focus because our next steps are to do further analysis where we're doing more detailed financials and ridership and cost information. Um, so our tier three analysis covered these main buckets you see on the left, and we created metrics from those um, buckets that you'll see on the right in the gray square. There were 10 metrics looking at travel time savings, again, important to, to everyone, existing commuter demand as well as potential commuter demand, um, relative recreational and discretionary potential for those recreational and discretionary routes, um, origin relative modal connections, geographic range of support, so that's that community interest piece um, and whether or not it's in current and recent plans, and then some more um, resiliency and seaworthiness elements. So now I'm going to step through each one. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so travel time savings. Um, you can see an example here on the left of where these different 18 routes that are in tier three kind of performed in our travel time analysis of comparative um, mode. Um, again, if a route was an urban route versus a non-urban route was whether it was compared to car travel or transit travel. Um, ridership potential, I saw a question about that. Um, we looked at this several different ways. Um, we used LEHD census data to look at um, existing commuter demand, you know, where are people living and working and making that connection now. Um, we looked at potential demand, looking at um, community survey census data, looking at working age population within different walk sheds of each terminal location. Um, and then we also looked at relative recreational and discretionary potential. And this was a bit of a qualitative analysis um, that we used a lot of information that was provided to us by our TPO partners. Um, we looked at Washington State Ferries um, passenger ridership information. We looked at hotel um, availability, um, hotel rooms at primary destinations, and walk scores at those destinations. Okay, next slide. Okay, modal connections. Here we are with this one. So, you know, someone brought it up. It's a really good point. It's what good is the terminal if you can't get there, right? And if it's, if that connection isn't good, or if it takes too long to get there, um, it really impacts your travel time and your travel time savings and how competitive a mode is. Um, so we, we gave modal connections two different metrics. We wanted to know what was the distance from the terminal to a modal connection and what was that quality of that connection? You know, is it just a simple bus stop that only takes you one direction or is it a multimodal hub that is, you know, this example here is the UW light rail station that can take you north and south. It also has buses that take you across the 520 bridge, etc. So it's not only that distance and time that it takes you, but also what kind of connection and quality is that once you get there. Again, um, we had to look at this from a commute potential, commute type of routes versus recreational discretionary routes, knowing that they're not the same, they don't act the same, the users that use these routes don't use them the same. Um, so for a commute route, um, a commute profile, something more regular, um, if it's in an urban terminal, we used transit, and if it was a non-urban terminal, it was the metric was parking. So how far are you from parking and how much parking? Um, for the recreational discretionary routes, that was the distance was the walking to transit or parking. And then the quality was the walk score of that location. So once you get there, what is there to go do and see within walking distance? Okay. Is there, um, Kaylin, do you, you let me know if you think we should stop in any of those, these because the next stopping point I have is in a couple slides. So you tell me what you think, otherwise I'll keep rolling to the next one. Yeah, I think we can keep rolling here. Okay. So community interest, let's go to that slide. 
Um, so again, community interest, we looked at um, the survey and, you know, if we, we took everything by county and looked at, okay, so everyone from um, Whatcom County, as an example, or everyone from King County, um, where was those percentages of which routes they're most interested in? And a lot of them were only interested in their, their county route, but a lot, some of them did have more broad range of support. And so we thought that that was important to showcase um, the Tacoma to Seattle site, the Port Angeles, Seattle, and Bellingham, Friday Harbor, Seattle sites were some of those notable ones. Um, additionally, you know, these jurisdictions, these regional transportation organizations, local agencies, they spend time and money on putting them in their long range plans or spending um, time and resources on studies um, to date that may not be reflected in long range plans. So we wanted to make sure that we identified and honored that. Um, so if, if a route was currently or had been studied in the past that was showing interest, um, then it also, that was a separate metric. Okay, I am ready for the next slide. Okay, so um, this is kind of rounding out our tier three analysis is resiliency and operational um, considerations. So we looked at, we wanted to incorporate resiliency in, in essential trips. We know that the North Sound was very interested in access to healthcare. Um, and then there's also many bridge and ferry dependent communities. Um, we know that passenger only ferries, wherever they are on the Puget Sound, contribute to our region's resiliency. Um, but we wanted to really focus in on what could differentiate the different locations. Um, we also know that commute-based ridership or something that has more fleet or more regular service may be more helpful in an emergency response situation. Yet again, in this analysis, we're really trying to focus on um, essential trip connections and, um, and another way off of an island or uh, of a bridge dependent geography. Um, another consideration was the operational considerations, the seaworthiness. Um, we had some help from our naval architects um, on our team to understand, um, you know, where there are both some qualitative and quantitative um, measures here. There's, uh, you know, how often something might be delayed due to sea states of winds, um, you know, different levels of waves or fetch. Um, and then also just the comfort of a ride, depending on where a, a vessel is traveling. So um, we took it, these into account and, you know, really in the, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, there is, um, you know, on that Eastern edge, the Port Angeles route, a little bit of the Port Townsend route experiences, um, you know, those waves there have a potential for more operational considerations of delays or having to slow down. Um, and then the, there was a Bellingham to um, Port Townsend route that is crossing seas and really would um, not be such a comfortable ride for folks. So we wanted to make sure that we identified that in the analysis as well. Okay, so that covers all 10 of our tier three criteria. And again, all 18 routes that you saw listed, they all received this level of analysis. Um, and so again, the intent is that in each of these levels, whether, you're, um, whether a particular route is identified in each tier or moved on to final analysis, that you have information to work on or um, if there's more interest in moving something forward, where the hurdles and obstacles are. And so each of these 10 criteria metrics, as well as all the backup documentation that went into finding these things out, were completed for all 18 of the tier three sites. And if you go to the next slide, Kaylin, you can see from our scoring, um, this is kind of where the 18 routes measured um, against each other, because again, um, limited resources of this study, our next phase of analysis is to dive deeper into terminal infrastructure needs, um, vessel needs, costs, ridership, and we really have limited resources to do that. Our original scope had about five sites to move forward with analysis and Gil will 
take us um, to the next slide here to identify what we are proposing, what we're moving forward with. Um, but just so you can see how they ranked once we looked at all 10 of our criteria. So, um, Gil, would you like me to pause here for questions or do you wanna go ahead and take it to the next slide where we show our eight routes for review? I wonder, it seems like there's some questions out there that are maybe we should touch on before we get into that. Uh, Absolutely. Like, and I think maybe one thing, I'm just noting a lot of questions about the studies. And so maybe we didn't cover that quite as well at the beginning uh, where I think, uh, you know, we did, in terms of, in terms of what, what the universe of studies we looked at, we looked at anything that occurred since 2008 when PSOC last did our, our uh, regional uh, passenger only ferry study. We didn't think there was any, as much value in going back before that. So it was anything since 2008. And yet there were some in, in progress studies. I think we already mentioned the Des Moines study. I think Seco Development doing a study in Renton. So, so when those are situations that are happening, we had the best available information we had on those studies. And we made sure to uh, be in touch with the, uh, the jurisdictions that are working on them. In the case of Des Moines, they just recently shared a study with us. So, so again, we will post uh, the, on the website the studies that we received. And we did that in our uh, phase one of the, of, of the um, planning. We had, to, we had to, given the short time, uh, uh, this study, we had to uh, advance. We couldn't wait for some of these studies to be finished. So that's why that is there. And there are any questions that uh, came on that you're noting that we want to go on before we make the big reveal on the next slide? Yeah, can you um, touch upon if the study went into specific challenges with appropriate docking capabilities, any challenges physically or with permitting? So, um, our study is not complete. We are only into analysis and have not completed analysis. Um, the approach of this study, again, was to um, focus on doing more detailed analysis on a few routes. And we're just, to date in this um, presentation, we've only explained how we have come to identify those routes that will receive further analysis, which includes financial review ridership review, environmental, terminal considerations, um, infrastructure, um, et cetera. Hopefully that answers some, of, I see several questions that are kind of related to. Yeah, that's great, thank ongoing you. Ongoing analysis. Um, can you explain why Orcas to Bellingham versus Friday Harbor to Bellingham was used given WSF's hub in Friday Harbor? Um, they're both on there. Um, I guess I wonder if the question is that the Washington State Ferries has a terminal at Friday Harbor, and uh, if that's if that is the question, then then um, then um, I think I think the idea there is that um, that, uh, that that this could be kind of resilience. It could be like an alternative to Washington State Ferry service at Friday Harbor. If that's the, that was the question. Yeah, and also if you look at number three, that's Bellingham Friday Harbor, and number sixteen is Orcas Island Bellingham. So they're actually both on the list, and we're both reviewed under Tier Three. And for studies that were close to the cutoff date, um, will there be a process to ensure that information from those studies informs the next phases? And will there be a potential to add or remove routes from those that have been chosen at an earlier stage? Uh, maybe should I, should I take that, Kristen? I, I don't think we're going back. We're not going back and redoing the analysis. I think that's maybe the, the main point here that again, given the time and, and scope and, and budget that we have here, we, we uh, had to cut off uh, when studies are done. So we are gonna work with the uh, jurisdictions that are, have uh, studies ongoing uh, to the best of our abilities, but we are not gonna go back and redo analysis. Uh, circling back to seaworthiness, did you consider hydrofoil options? Um, so we haven't identified any vessel profile for a route, but we have um, had conversations with um, the team that's working on the, the new hydrofoil boat and um, Department of Commerce um, to make sure that that information and that study is actually in our um, existing conditions and studies uh, I don't. I don't know if you're planning on having that documentation on the website, Gail, or maybe if just a list. But um, that information, that technology, will be listed in our study. But we're not profiling it. If that makes sense. Yes, we'll put what's on the study up on our on our website. Yes. Great. 
Anything else? Gil, are you seeing any any other ones that aren't going to be addressed later? Um, I think uh, we, maybe we can just go on to the, the big reveal here, and we'll, and I think it's getting close to the end of our presentation. We can then take just any other questions that are asked that we uh, missed here uh, at that point. Okay. Great. So here's the big reveal. Uh, Kristen showed 18 routes that went through the tier three analysis. And, uh, and as she mentioned, the next phase here, phase four, is where we're going to be uh, uh, looking at doing a deeper dive on some of the specific routes. A lot of the things that people were asking about would be things I think, I think uh, not all of them, but I mean, some of the things like looking at a little bit more detail about some of the ridership and some of the um, um, uh, aspects about the, uh, the terminal uh, would, would be addressed here. We're talking about capital and operating and things like that that are addressed in these route profiles. And, um, and we had budget originally for a smaller number of them, about uh, uh, five or so, I believe, for what we were originally scoping for. But as you see on this list here, we do have several that are, uh, again, the benefit of these recent studies are coming, coming to uh, fruition here. We have a list of, it looks like, uh, uh, we're thinking about possibly eight of these uh, routes can be taken. Uh, you'll see at the top, we have a, a high scoring recreational discretionary route. Bellingham to Friday Harbor was, uh, I believe, number three on the list that Kristen showed. Uh, we have the four lake routes that are shown there. All of them have some fairly recent studies, and it could be kind of an update of existing information to provide uh, uh, a, a route profile that covers several uh, Lake Washington routes there. And they were all, uh, again, in the, top, in the top half of the, of the uh, routes that were identified in, in the tier three analysis. Then we have a couple of routes shown kind of down here, uh, Tacoma, Seattle, and Big Harbor to Seattle, kind of covering the Pierce County to, to Seattle area. And uh, they were uh, scored very high. Tacoma to Seattle was the highest uh, ranked one in that tier three analysis. And Big Harbor was also, uh, uh, I think it was number five on that list. So again, it makes sense to kind of look at those very uh, top level um, routes to be able to do that further analysis. And then we have two that are shown in gray that are alternate uh, potential alternate examples. Uh, we're currently in the process of doing some government-to-government -government, uh, discussion with the Suquamish. That was a very high scoring uh, route. It scored number two in the tier three analysis. We want to make sure and, and work with them on that. And um, and if that and if that works out, that would be the route we do since it is higher scoring than the, the South would be ever. South would be ever would be the alternate that we would provide. So at this point, I think we want to just share this information. These would be the route that gives a very good um, uh, range of potential routes, both looking at discretionary routes, some more commute-based ones. Uh, we look at different, some lake ones and some uh, Puget Sound ones, and an opportunity for us to kind of do uh, this a little bit further route profiling on these types of passenger-only ferry routes to provide information to the jurisdictions and communities that are looking at this uh, within the within the region and within the study area. Um, and I guess just maybe to re reinforce what we talked about earlier. Um, all these, we had 45 routes that went that we looked at in tier uh, one, and I see a lot of comments about why not looking at this one or that one. There were so many different iterations of potential routes within the 12 county study area. It was a very, very large area for us to look at, and I think we used the uh, survey results to help us whittle that down to the 45. Uh, I think each of those 45 have information in it now that will help them in their planning for passenger only ferry. They'll have a good assessment of what, what they need to accomplish in order to advance uh, passenger only ferry within their community. Um, so at this point though, I think we wanna pause and take any feedback we have on, on, uh, on the potential routes that we have on this table for uh, analysis and, um, and any other questions you might have before we move on to the next stages. A uh, question if you can speak to, was it community interest that contributed to South Woodby Everett? Um, can you repeat that? Was there community interest in South Woodby Everett? Ever? Yeah, if you can speak to the level of community interest at all in that route. Do you recall, Kristen, uh, on that one? You're, you're muted. Okay. Um, Yes, there was community interest in that route. Are there other questions, Kiel? Yeah, looking through here. So uh, I know the budget is limited, but is there a chance to do both optional routes, both the Squamish and Seattle and Southwood B. Everett, since these are the only routes that are in Kitsap? 
uh, Kitsap Island and Snohomish counties, excuse me. The answer is no. Uh, that, that, that is, the, I think, one of the limiting factors here. We have both budget and time frame. So as you know, these are both new route profiles. So that's, uh, it's both a, a matter of the amount of work that uh, goes into providing a new route profile. Um, so yeah, we won't be able to do both. We can do one um, or the other. Can you go into any more detail on why Everett in Seattle is not considered a route? Everett to Seattle is a, is a route. Uh, I believe it was, um, uh, but it, lo it ranked lower. Um, so if you'll see on uh, uh, the tier three analysis results, it came in it, it came in at number thirteen in that in that assessment. So our proposal here was to look at the higher ranked routes from that uh, tiered analysis, given that we we provided information from the survey on terms of what was important to the different communities within the study area, and um, and they helped uh, they helped inform this evaluation criteria as well as the different routes being studied. So it just made sense to go look at the uh, higher ranking routes in this in this case. So they, they, Everett to Seattle is in there. It's just lower ranking. Yeah, and I can I can provide a little more insight as to why it's the lower ranking is um, modal connections at the terminal potential terminal sites, um, as well as um, yeah, there was terminal connections, and then it was also I have my spreadsheet, so I can just pull it up and look right now. Um, it had really high commuter potential low um, on support, not a lot of community support. It's not in um, an existing long range plan um, and low modal connections. That was what contributed. Can you go into more detail on what happened to the routes that were touching Olympia? Yes, uh, and I, I saw that there was a comment coming in on that. So I think uh, maybe uh, somebody arrived late, but I also we didn't go into that detail. But I think as uh, Kristen mentioned, we, this is a tiered route analysis. And uh, Olympia in tier one, uh, it goes through Dana Passage. And that was a confined waterway, uh, I think Kristen mentioned earlier. And then in tier two, uh, so what, what we did in tier one, uh, maybe I should let you talk about this, Kristen. Sure. I'll, I'll... Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so for Olympia, it not only has the constraint of Dana Passage and the constrained waterway with single family residential on either side of that waterway, making it um, very difficult, but also, um, so if you slow way down, um, that was the time, travel time, say, travel time profile that we had to provide is that you can't go fast through that area. So you have to slow way down. And when you do that, you're not time competitive. And, and I'll just kind of reinforce what we were saying earlier. Uh, I mean, it's not to say that Olympia to these other places is, it, it's, it's uh, not a good route. I mean, it, it just, we just went through this tiered analysis. So now uh, we think that uh, Olympia community has an informa has information on what they need, what kind of hurdles need to be addressed to uh, make passenger only ferry feasible if that is something the community wants to look at. Um, as an example, so as Kristen mentioned, you know, looking at confined waterways, that a good example of what the community had to go through with that is with Rich Passage in Kitsap County and the studying that needed to go through there to address the environmental concerns on shorelines would be one of the, one of the uh, things I think a community like Olympia would look at in that case. Can you go into more detail by what you mean by a joint uh, joint profile on the Lake Washington routes? Sure. Um, so we thought it would be helpful to kind of put all of the lake routes together um, and kind of look at how they kind of compare against each other or look um, as far as profile if they're different or the same. Um, and so it, it'll be more of a higher level look because we have a lot of existing data. So these, this is one reason why we're able to do more routes um, is that we're going to be looking at the lake routes on a higher level because we have rich information from the King County Metro studies that have been done, from the SECO development um, studies that have been done. Um, so we're able to do that and it made sense to look at all of them rather than to only pick a few. Great. And there's a lot of route specific questions. So would it be possible to, to get detail on the criteria analysis for the ro those routes that did not make the cut? I think the intent is we're going to produce uh, uh, some materials here again as we develop the draft study that will in include that information about um, about the routes. I think um, just kind of the, the 
what we're talking with the consultants about exactly how to, how to, how to share that in the report. But I think that um, expectation is to have information on, on how these routes fared in the, in the assessment that, in, in that draft report. Is that uh, yeah, anything to add to that, Kristen, just to make sure? Yeah, so um, our intent is to have, uh, you know, kind of these profiles within um, the appendix of the report that kind of shows, um, you know, here were the routes that were um, analyzed as part of tier one, here are the routes that were analyzed as part of tier two, and then more detailed profiles on each of the routes that were in tier three, so that you'll have that data to move forward with. Could you give a brief summary of the considerations on the Des Moines South Earth route? Of the considerations. What's meant by that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I need more information. Okay, Gerald, if you could follow up there, that would be great. Uh, with regards to rankings. Rankings. Okay. Like how it scored? Yeah, rankings, ratings. Okay. It came in 12th in our overall tier three analysis. Isn't that right, Kristen? Yep, that's right. I'm just looking at the some scoring so I can give um, Jerry some more info. Um, okay, so this one is an interesting and odd. Um, it's different than all the rest of them because it's more of an airport route. So this is a, a unique profile. Um, not a lot of commuter ridership, but um, different type of ridership, right? Like a uh, airport, you know, Jerry, you're with the port. So I'm sure you had a question about that. Um, not only did we have to identify that it would come into the Des Moines Marina, but then adding travel time of a shuttle. Um, and also it's not currently mentioned in um, many studies. There is one study that's ongoing, which the, um, the city did identify. So it got some points for that. Not a lot of support from our survey. Um, more of the, we kind of rank that from a one, two, and three, more of a lower level from the studies. And so that modal connection is um, where it's a little bit more challenging because it requires a seat change. So Clallam County had the second highest survey response rate, but no routes advanced for further analysis. Can you speak to why? I think maybe just to mention that uh, Clallam uh, County, uh, their uh, Port Angeles to Seattle route is in the tier three analysis. It was ranking number 14, so it was lower down. And I think maybe Kristen, can you speak to some of the points? I think some of the seaworthiness aspects of that was, was maybe one of the aspects that. Uh, yeah, so seaworthiness and also, um, let me just look at it here. We're, we're doing this live, just I'm okay. looking at it and I'm telling you what the, what's going on here. Um, okay, so. That one is, of course, a recreational discretionary route. It's not um, a ridership, commuter ridership destination route. As far as our qualitative, like relative recreational potential, um, we scored that lower than the Port Townsend route because of its walkability. Um, and let's see, as far as modal connections, modal connection quality, that was a little bit more challenging because of parking. Um, and it also was not, is not mentioned in any current or recent studies. As well as the operational component, that seaworthiness, that was another um, aspect too, that it would have potential delays, would have to be slowed down, or may not be a comfortable ride for the passenger. So the question here on kind of intermediate stops. Could you clarify if Des Moines is included in either the Gig Harbor Seattle or the Tacoma Seattle routes as a stop, or was it only included in the Southworth consideration? So should I take, start with that uh, um, and then take it on, Kristen? I think uh, just as again, kind of this was a very large uh, scale study, 12 counties, uh, a lot of different options, a lot of different opportunities. So in order to uh, simplify the analysis, we decided to go from point to point we decided not to develop routes that had multiple stops in between. So you'll see a Tacoma to Seattle, Everett to Seattle, but not place it, stopping at places in between that. Um, not to say that an implementer couldn't take this information and, and create that. It just, uh, though, though as, uh, with considerations like that, as with any transit, when you add more stops, that does uh, uh, impact the travel time between the two, the origin and the destination. So uh, do you want to take anything beyond that, Kristen? No, I think you said everything I would say. 
Okay. Uh, in addition to posting on the website, will you be able to email the PowerPoint to all participants? Oh, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> it's linked on, it's linked in, Mich Michelle Leslie has provided a link for everyone here in the chat. And I saw a clarifying question from the person about asked about South Whidbey Everett and why it's either or. Um, again, we uh, just had, uh, we have resources in, in the uh, budget uh, in the scope to do the eight uh, routes, uh, not not uh, more than that. And, and we, what we did look at, actually, we looked at, uh, it was originally a scope to, for five routes for the deeper dive. But as you can see, uh, we looked at the estimate with the uh, existing studies that are in place, the, the more recent studies, and that allowed us to go uh, for additional routes. So we think this is good news. We're doing more route profiles than we originally planned, but we can't do two new route profiles. In terms of the, that's why it's the either or, and in terms of being Suquamish first, that was the higher ranking one. That was uh, ranked number two if you look at the, the tier three analysis. So that, that's kind of what that, what's going on there. We wish we'd had an, a, a, a response and be able to tell you the specific aid at this time, but we're still working that through and didn't want to uh, delay the webinar. I also see a question about, um, I don't know if it was missed, about South Whidbey and Everett. Um, so as I was speaking to the modal connections of Everett Seattle from the Everett um, side of things, uh, as far as our South would be Everett um, route, that one scored pretty low in comparison for um, ridership potential and existing commute ridership as it relates to the other um, locations. So there are three uh, UW routes on Lake Washington. Is there a possibility to drop or combine uh, on any of those routes to do both of the optional routes? Can you repeat that, Kaelin? I, I think. Uh, I that. Yeah, since there's uh, three routes on Lake Washington, is there any way to combine or drop any of those routes to incorporate uh, both of the the new route profiles for alternates? Um, really, uh, not. I mean, the benefit of the of the Lake Washington routes are they are uh, refreshing information that's already in place from from recent studies. So it's not like uh, uh, removing like two of them or something like that would. Uh, result in a new route profile. It's just a, it's kind of an assessment of the amount of work it takes. And some of these, like the Suquamish to Seattle, were a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit easier because uh, uh, some of the you know, work on routes to Seattle, uh, South Whidbey Everett might be a little bit more work. Uh, that's completely new uh, in this area. So, so I think that's, um, that's kind of the assessment we've made. Uh, but I guess it's good feedback that, that maybe a, a fewer of the, uh, I mean, the, the idea we had here was we have a, a nice comprehensive look at some uh, a joint profile of Lake, of lake routes, uh, um, but I, I don't think we—I don't think it will be equivalent to be able to remove some portions of those and then and bring up another additional new route. We thought we were being generous by having eight. <laughs> we see negotiations here to get get some more in. Um. Comment from Ed here, just wanted to make, Ed from uh, Kitsap Transit, uh, can it may be clear um, in the study that the tier three routes may warrant further study at a future date? Um, I don't want to shut the door for all, um, all of the possibilities. Yeah, I think we, just to be crystal clear, I, we, we tried to say this a few times in this, that I think all of these routes uh, could warrant some further study. They could warrant some further work in, in studying uh, the potential of there, even things that as we mentioned with Olympia, they would need to address their confined waterway. So I, I think that's the idea here is that we're, uh, we're uh, giving additional information on, on a wide number of routes in this 12 county study area that should be helpful to anybody who wants to, to take next steps for implementation. So definitely not shutting the door on anything that's uh, shown in that tier three list. And in fact, we have extensive information on all 18 of these sites, of these routes. Um, can you go into what assumptions are made as to vessel types, monohull versus cat, what speeds, what weight characteristics? Yeah, so we haven't um, gotten into vessel design whatsoever. Um, and in the next phase of our study, we'll be identifying um, really vessel costs. We're not even looking at the vessel type, but vessel costs and fuel costs. So, um, you know, we assume that the lake routes will likely have a different type of vessel than um, our Puget Sound routes, ones that are more in the open water versus not. So we're not going into a lot of detail, just using, um, looking at what existing operators are using, what's the most efficient, and putting some assumptions for costs only. 
as for capital and operating, but not identifying details on vessels. Great. So a comment from um, someone living on Woodby Island and commuting daily puzzles them as to why that scored so low. Um, they didn't hear about any outreach taking place on Woodby. Is there any community specific outreach like that that is taking place? I think the community outreach, we, we conducted that survey in May. And so I think community support was part of this. And I think in fact, the uh, Whidbey Island ones, Island County got some support there, right? They were getting community support and part of what um, brought them in. Am I mistaking on that, uh, Kristen? There were some community support on the, on the Island yeah. County. But, uh, yep. So, so it's not, it, they're in here because of the community support. So in part, in part because of the community support. So with regards to the Des Moines Southworth route, if there was a future consideration of the Des Moines stop for the Seattle Tacoma route, would the scoring for shared variables such as seaworthiness, modal connections, et cetera, be uh, applicable? And would all those variables need all those variables need to be reassessed? You want to take that one, Kristen? I'm, I'm... Yeah, I, I was having a hard time following it, so I'm going to read it from the chat frame okay. here. Um, yeah, question from J.C. Harris of Des Moines City Council. Yeah, I'm not sure that I understand. Are you asking, oh, would it need, would this work need to be redone? Is that what we're, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, maybe, yep. maybe some more information. I guess maybe I'm just going to go back to kind of what we said earlier. Maybe this was from before that, but we did take just point to point. We didn't take in uh, multiple stops. So that was kind of, that's the thing that we uh, um, we did there. So that's why it's like Tacoma to Seattle. Oh, South right. Area. Okay. So another thing to mention too, is that this is a really high level um, planning study. And so one of the, one of our, um, one of our ideas for in the draft plan um, that we're going to be bringing to you in the next couple of months is to share what some of these like stop options may be in like a sidebar. Not that we're analyzing them for financials or ridership, but just that, hey, you know, there's been interest in, and also this site is on the way from Tacoma to Seattle. Um, but just keep in mind that any time that you make a stop, um, it hurts your ridership. So there's, there's that that can be said for Des Moines on the Tacoma to Seattle route as well as I know there's interest in Orcas um, from a Bellingham, Friday Harbor, Orcas Island. Um, so that may also warrant, you know, a call out box that really, you know, draws attention to that and is mentioned in the study, but not analyzed in detail. Yeah, item for consideration, I've seen a few, few times here. Um, comment from Nathan that I'll kind of sum up is, I uh, guess feels guess it feels like a lot of these routes are King County centric. If Everett route is excluded, all routes uh, go to Seattle, except the Bellingham one. And Snohomish County is one of the fastest growing areas. Yeah, maybe I'll just uh, add in there uh, uh, for Nathan, uh, just kind of, uh, I mean, these are all, all, the, all the routes, just as a reminder, we you know, started off with 45, right? And we uh, put them through all the same criteria. And so it's not that, uh, you know, it was no, there was no kind of, uh, Magic juice here for King County, I guess that that made it, uh, it. That's just the way it came out. And things like when we took it, look at ridership and and modal connections and a variety of things like that. I don't think it uh, it seems very intuitive to me that uh, that a lot of that demand goes into uh, Seattle, where a lot of a lot of big jobs and a lot of big you know larger uh, centers are that kind of a thing, uh, and, and a very transit rich environment. So, so I, again, just to remind you, I, I mean that the, the um, we had the same criteria for all those forty five routes, and so it's just the way it came out. So regarding the criteria for selection of routes, was there any discussion of avoiding migratory routes of whales? It, uh, you can repeat that. Were there any consideration taken for migratory routes of whales? Is that what the question Correct, is? correct. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think at this level, I mean, this is kind of something I think, uh, Kristen, maybe I'll just uh, uh, tee this up and maybe you can say more, but I think uh, there are some kind of programmatic kinds of aspects of things we've come across in the comments that we received to date. And I think that's kind of one of the things whenever you're operating any kind of vessel on Puget Sound, 
I think marine mammals and, and, and that kind of uh, thing is, is something to be considered, right? There's other, other factors out there. So uh, it seems like one thing that could come out of this would be some kind of programmatic uh, recommendations for anyone who's an implementer who's trying to uh, implement a route. You know, there could be aspects about that. Um, uh, Kristen, do you want to say anything beyond that? Or? Yeah, just that, you know, any of the ferry operators on the line know too is that there's extensive operating protocols and partnerships and none of this will be able to be implemented or happen without those operating protocols and things in place. And this is a very high level study um, with many of these routes being impacted and, you know, these migratory patterns and other things can change. Um, same thing with bull kelp and um, eelgrass, all those different environmental considerations is really just going to be um, mentioned in our report that like all of that needs to happen at the um, you know, permitting level at the um, in more detail and operating protocol will take place far before anything gets in the water or is planned in more detail. So this is, this did not consider migratory patterns, but really that that exists all around us in Puget Sound and um, will need to be looked at further. Um, could you clarify whether the Renton to South Lake Union and Renton to UW um, is one route or two? Seems UW is on the way to South Lake Union from Renton. Yeah, so um, those are unique routes. Um, the Renton to UW route um, is a, you know, ends in UW, serves a kind of a different profile than we're assuming that the South Lake Union route would serve, which is more of a tech community, um, harder to get to South Lake Union from UW um, as far as modal connections go. So this is one of those route profiles that is being studied. There's other South Lake Union um, type of ferry routes being studied as well. So it, it is very unique and different, even though it is UW is on the way. And I think we already mentioned at one point, you know, again, we looked at point to point, there could be, you know, an implementer could look at diff different variations, but of course they would have to go in in their implementation study that would be studying those, you know, the impacts of, of adding stops and things like that. So right. um, I'll just, I'll just add, there's another comment here, uh, kind of uh, Senator Hunt to mentioning about the long time it takes to get from Olympia to Seattle on I-5 uh, and, and the comparative uh, yeah. uh, assessment of a uh, passenger length ferry between those points. Uh, again, I think uh, I think this provides information. I think we mentioned it earlier, and I think we'd be happy to, to meet with you or other Olympia uh, stakeholders to talk about this in further detail if you like. But I think in this case, you know, we again took these uh, through the same um, evaluation criteria, and we in, in part used the surveys that we've done to kind of uh, inform that evaluation criteria. In the case of Olympia, it was just the combined waterways and combined with the, uh, the the travel times. And so again, I think it provides good information for that community to be able to to uh, work ad on advancing passenger line ferry if that is a priority that they want to uh, look at. Um, just to note also from previous um, discussions, uh, you know, we've talked about Seattle a little bit, and I think there's a, a lot that's coming to Seattle. So the Seattle capacity issue would also be something, you know, further down the road that would be we needed to look at as well. So just uh, just a few comments there. But again, we're happy to, to meet with, uh, with you to talk about that. So. Yeah, sorry, the chat has been moving pretty fast. So I'm just scrolling back up to make sure nothing was missed. Um, we'll definitely take an uh, inventory of, of all comments that have, have been made here. Yeah, and maybe it's worth pointing out, Kaylin, uh, like we did at the last webinar, we, uh, we can also develop, a, 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 we can look at the questions and answers and either get back to people individually. Uh, uh, we have your emails from registering if it's something very specific, or we can uh, develop an update to our questions and answers on our website. We had that from our last uh, webinar as well. Um, I just want to note, we have, I think, a slide or two to go. If, we, if it is uh, slowing down, Kaylin, just make sure we have some time to, to get the next steps before we end this. Oh, thank you, Monica. Um, Gil, can you uh, address concerns of the low ranking excluding of the Everett to Seattle route? Um, address the low, low ranking of Everett to Seattle? Yes. Um, that was, uh, let's see here. Um, I think that I was right that. Pardon me? I think I covered that earlier. Um, really, it's modal connections, 
Um, the location in Everett that is most time competitive is in the South um, Port Terminal Marina, um, which has many modal connection hurdles. Um, there's a, a large commute ridership potential in Everett, um, over 50,000. So that's why it's on this list, even though it wasn't um, chosen very frequently in community interest, um, there's this huge ridership potential there. So we wanted to make sure that we reviewed it. Um, but there are a lot of, a lot of hurdles with modal connections in Everett that make it very challenging. And when you move um, further north, then the time competitiveness becomes a factor as well. Like if it was further north into the marina, then it doesn't meet the time competitiveness factor. So um, those were the big hurdles that we were seeing in Everett. And also that it's not in long range planning documents. Um, we know that the South Wigby to Everett is, has been in some recent studies, but we haven't seen the Everett to Seattle interest in more long-term studies or recent studies. Hope that answers that question. Yeah, so I think it might be a good point that we can move on and then follow up in individually, as well as providing more information on the website. If anything, I guess maybe just sum up that, that slide. I think that we heard uh, interest in, can we do more? <laughs> and so, so I guess that's how I would summarize it up. I mean, if, if, if the most uh, common comments I was hearing is, is there a possibility to include both Suquamish, Seattle, and South Whidbey Everett. Uh, again, we, we can only include one or the other, so, um, so unfortunately so. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just uh, if you wouldn't mind clicking one more time, uh, Kaelin, I think you uh, highlight the next step uh, there. Phase four is where we're going with this. Um, we've just completed the webinar here shown on uh, August 20th. And so this comp uh, completes the uh, initial findings and, and providing you a study status. Uh, with this, uh, uh, we'll be transitioning to doing the deeper dive on the, on the routes that are identified there. We're gonna work on that, those last couple there to identify which of those two we're going to do further work on. Um, again, we're planning to have another webinar in October. And the idea there is we uh, hope, we're planning to have the uh, draft of the, of the study that we can place on the website for people to look at and then announce that um, the, the webinar date and time so people can have a chance to look at it and be able to then come to the webinar, hear our, hear our presentation and, and ask any questions at that time. Um, and again, this is kind of just, uh, uh, just to uh, reiterate, I mean, we, this has been a, a we had, had a, a short time frame to do this very broad study. Uh, we uh, did uh, do a, a lot of outreach. We could that we tried to reach out to as many stakeholders as we could early on. And we've been working with our uh, regional planning organization uh, partners. So you can see we have another RTPO meeting planned uh, before that, that webinar in October. Uh, I think that's the last slide. Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, there's just one last, just as a reminder for anyone who's interested, this is the uh, link to our website where all the project information is kept. Uh, we will add information such as was requested, what are the list of studies we looked at and incorporate it into our, into our planning. We'll, we'll add that on as well as other things. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the uh, study web, uh, the study email address that's shown here. And with that, I think I'll, I'll conclude and, and, and uh, leave it open to any other questions that are um, out there. Do we have anything else, Keelan? Or? Uh, nothing coming in so far. Okay. I think we have a few more minutes uh, so we can kind of uh, see if anyone's typing anything in before we uh, let them go. Um, question from Ed at Kitsap Transit. Will you be coordinating with the RTPOs for additional outreach? I think the intent, yes, we are going to have another RTPO, uh, um, well, a meeting, we have a, a gathering of the RTPO uh, representatives uh, that uh, we, that's what's been listed in the, um, in the um, schedule that was uh, presented earlier. If uh, an RTPO wants us to go out and speak or, or make a presentation, we could certainly do that. I think the intent just in general for like some outreach, uh, and Kristen, maybe you can add to this, is for those uh, route profiles, we will be kind of working with, uh, again, the stakeholders who have, who have knowledge and interest in in those in those uh, particular routes, so those that can inform the study are are ones that we're going to be reaching out to uh, to make sure um, we have information we need for those route profiles. 
That's correct. And we have um, RTPO briefings scheduled um, prior to the webinar, as you mentioned, and we've been using that um, platform and it's been very helpful to get us, um, you know, Susan sent us some, some uh, economic development and, and tourism information and it's been really helpful. So, um, and I think that we're relying on everyone to get the word out in that way as well. And I know, Ed, you work, for an RP, uh, work with an RTPO in addition to your job at uh, Kitsap, so Kitsap Transit. So if you, uh, just to reiterate, if you guys uh, want a presentation or whatever, just please reach out. A uh, question from Joe. Can you repeat, repeat what you said about Senator Hunt's question or make, make public uh, your answer to his question? I think there was something about confined waterways that make POF unfeasible. Yeah, and maybe, you know, uh, I'll just reiterate this uh, again. Uh, I think it's worth uh, with that because uh, Thurston Regional Planning Organization is, is, is uh, one of the regions and, and, and uh, they have information to kind of help them with their, their routes. They had a couple of routes in the, but, but they, they didn't make it into tier three. So I'll just kind of reiterate that. Uh, Dana Passage, I believe, is the one, uh, uh, Kristen, that uh, has a confined waterway that's between Olympia. And, and we had two routes, Olympia to Seattle and Olympia to Tacoma. Dana passages between those. So that created a um, situation where it would go through a confined waterway. There'd need to be um, studies for that, um, that kind of environmental um, impact on the shorelines. Uh, in, in some cases, we, you know, with these confined waterways, I think we just took the, uh, took the routes out, but we kept this one in uh, for the Olympia ones in for tier two. Uh, but we, what we did to say that is we uh, slowed it down for, because one way you can do it uh, with uh, confined waterways is to slow down the, the, the vessel. So with that, with that uh, in, in input in there, the time competitiveness did not work out. So tier three, tier two was looking at time, time competitiveness. So those are the two factors that are in there. Uh, it is a, a confined waterway, and then there's time competitiveness. So I think uh, uh, initial thing there would be to look at that um, confined waterway if, um, is my, my, my thinking. And again, it's not saying that it's not feasible. It's just saying that there are some pretty significant obstacles before you would implement a route. Um, could be years of environmental monitoring, could be a special test vessel. Um, you can look at the Ridge Passage One and Kitsap Transit as an example of the hard work and long time and money that they put into studying and making sure that um, their service meets the, the criteria of that waterway. So um, not that it's not feasible um, anytime in the future or that it would be an enjoyable ride rather than sitting on I-5, because I agree. Um, but just that there's really significant hurdles and and this study will hopefully, you know, help to inform that if you if that um, jurisdiction wanted to move forward with further analysis. So in addition to the coordination with the Suquamish, um, will there be consideration with uh, with the tribes? I, I, you know, we've we've uh, we've uh, been uh, we've had some comments from Muckleshoot uh, uh, previously, and then we had the, our recent government-to-government uh, -government meeting with the Suquamish, and so certainly um, uh, keeping them up to date on on, on the uh, study and, and where it's progressing is, is that's part of our intent of this of this uh, study to keep keep them up to date on it. And I, I believe we're going to be communicating with the Suquamish again here, uh, particularly as, as relates to um, the the route, but also other other concerns that they've identified in their in their comments. So. And for the Everett to Seattle route, did you consider other comparable locations such as Mukilteo? I think again, kind of, we started off with a wide variety of potential locations, right? And so I think we, I think part of the um, that initial survey, we had the the sites that had been studied before, and then just kind of reiterate, there was an open open-ended opportunity for people to identify the the uh, origins and destinations, and those that met a th certain threshold were the ones that were advanced. So people had an opportunity to add in. A to uh, wherever site. I don't think it met the thresholds. Uh, Kristen, is that correct? Okay. And that looks like most of the questions so far. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for for uh, participating, for providing your feedback and your input into the study. Again, it's, it's really important for us to get this uh, input. It helps uh, make the study better. And so we look forward to your continued involvement with, with us uh, over the next few months. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks.